most of you I have fixed in my mind as we all looked 35 years ago, and it's a little hard to look around and exactly figure out who's who uh, for, for our group, but it, it, it's wonderful uh, to have you here, and th thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, I'm Bob DuPont, and uh, as the president of the institute, we're going to keep this running if, if people don't mind. I, if it's distracting, that's another kind of thing, but I think it's kind of kind of fun. Uh, but it does make the uh, fact that when you're presenting up here, you've got some competition. So we can always unplug it. Uh, uh, I'm the president of the Institute for Behavior and Health, and we're uh, uh, very happy as an organization to be uh, one of the sponsors of, of, the, uh, of the event. Uh, but at a much more uh, personal level, uh, our, and, uh, and in terms of the, very, the event itself, uh, we have three uh, sponsors of this, and that's uh, Jerry Jaffe, Paul Perito, uh, and, and myself. Uh, and we have, in addition, uh, some more formal sponsorship, including uh, financial support, uh, from the Nixon Library. Uh, and uh, we're just very pleased to have the, the, the Nixon Library and Foundation uh, involved in this, because, of course, the uh, event that we're celebrating uh, had everything to do with that administration, and we're very pleased that the leaders uh, uh, in the Nixon administration who dealt with drugs, uh, including uh, Jeff Shepard and Jeff Donfeld and Bud Krogh, are here over at this table. And uh, our speaker tonight, David Courtright, will be talking about the Nixon, uh, the politics of Nixon's uh, drug policy too. And it's it's been fun to share at that table the. Uh, talking of uh, thinking about all the things that were going on at that, at that time. I want to begin, though, before we start uh, Jerry's program here, uh, to have Sam Roche come up and say just a few words about the interest of the Nixon Library and Foundation. And he's going to introduce Jeff Shepard, too. And the point he wants to make, which he will make himself, is that they're very interested in talking to many of the people who are here uh, for, the point of, uh, for the uses of the, uh, of the Nixon Foundation. Uh, and very uh, uh, engaged in the idea that this was one of the principal, uh, the drug policy was one of the principal accomplishments of the, of the Nixon administration. So, Sam, speak, come right up and speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. DuPont. Uh, it's, it certainly is a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm Sam Ruscha. I am uh, an archivist and supervisor at the uh, Nixon Presidential Materials Staff, or the Nixon Staff in College Park, uh, Maryland. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a, a background on that, you may be aware of the Nixon uh, Library, uh, or, or the Nixon Staff in your, or otherwise known as the Nixon Staff in Yorba Linda, uh, which uh, is uh, in Yorba Linda, California. Uh, where the Richard Nixon Library is located. The Richard Nixon Library uh, was built in 1990, uh, built from private funds and was privately operated uh, uh, during that time from 1990 until uh, last year. And it's been in, in, the, uh, in uh, the process of becoming federalized. And this June, uh, I have the pleasure to say that the Nixon Library uh, will be uh, the 12th presidential library in the presidential library system admi administered by the National Archives and Records Administration. Uh, the presidential records uh, that I work with are in College Park, Maryland, and they will be moving to uh, the Richard Nixon Library uh, in Yorba Linda in stages uh, over the next four years, we anticipate. Uh, and uh, as I said, the, this, the library will be federalized this June, and then the, uh, the Nixon materials, including the Nixon White House gifts, uh, the audiovisual materials, and the textual materials uh, will be moving to the federal facility in, in, uh, in Yorba Linda. Uh, I, I do not plan to go uh, with the materials, uh, but there are some of my colleagues uh, that work in College Park that will, will be going uh, to the library. Um, Tim Naftali is the director of the Nixon Library and the Nixon, that is the Nixon staff in, in College Park and the Nixon staff in Yorba Linda. Uh, he could not make it today. I know he very much wanted to be here, but he had a previous engagement. Uh, so I am here on his behalf, and again, it's my, my pleasure. I really look forward to this, this program. Uh, 
As part of Tim Naftali's uh, 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 vision for the library, he wants a, uh, a vibrant museum uh, program uh, that includes the, the, the uh, underwriting of the video that's being prepared today uh, for use in a, in a library exhibit uh, in your Belinda and, uh, and a virtual exhibit uh, on, the, on the internet. Uh, he's, he's very conscious of the need to have uh, self-guided uh, museum exhibits uh, that are narrated by the participants themselves, uh, th which makes uh, this kind of event uh, uh, so important to him. Uh, in addition to these kinds of public programs, he's interested in, 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 an, in an active oral history program. So he, he would be interested in using excerpts from uh, interviews with many of, of you in this room, uh, including uh, uh, Bud Krogh. Uh, who he very much wants to include uh, in, in an exhibit uh, for, uh, so that visitors to the library uh, can, can go through an exhibit on uh, the Nixon administration's drug abuse prevention activities and actually hear uh, the, the words of the participants, uh, the policymakers, in the words themselves. And, uh, and he thinks, and I, I certainly agree, that, that is a, it adds a lot of depth and, uh, and uh, richness to a museum exhibit, as well as uh, online exhibits that he wants to put uh, through the, the Nixon Library's website. Uh, so uh, we would be interested in talking to many of you in this room. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeffrey Shepard, who will say some words uh, on, on that subject. Uh, the, uh, the revamped oral history program uh, at the Nixon, the Nixon Library. I say revamped because uh, uh, the, the oral history program uh, at the Nixon uh, uh, presidential material staff has, has, has been in fits and starts. Um, in 1973 and 74, when many people let, when, when individuals were, staff members were leaving the Nixon administration, there were exit interviews that were conducted through the Office of Presidential Papers and Archives. About 15 years later, in 1987 and 1988, the Nixon uh, staff embarked on a limited number of, of oral history uh, interviews with people. And then about five years ago, uh, we, we did another uh, uh, limited number of, of oral histories. But what we're talking about here is much more comprehensive. And, uh, and that's, why, uh, that's why it's important that we, uh, that we have a, an active oral history program. So again, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and on behalf of Mr. Naftali uh, and John Taylor of the Nixon uh, uh, Foundation, uh, who has helped underwrite the cost of the video of this program, uh, as well as the, uh, the keynote speaker, uh, uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Shepard, Jeffrey Shepard. Thank you very much. Thank you. you got to have a light because we want to get this on the tape. I am allergic to recordings. Oh, no. <laughs> with, uh, with Bob and Jerry's indulgence, we're doing this just a little bit backwards, but uh, we didn't want to break up the program. So uh, we wanted to tell you of three substantive things that have occurred uh, and, and come together very, very recently with regard to the Nixon records. As Sam indicated, the 42 million pages and 34,000 state gifts that have been in College Park are going to the Nixon Library, and the Nixon Library is becoming a federal institution for the first time. So the research that, that will be done is going to be done out there. Uh, uh, there's a new federal director, Tim Naftali, and Tim's highest priority right now, because of actuarial uh, requirements, is to do oral histories on the people who were a part of the next administration. And they mean videotape. So you can, you know, go watch. And, and it's, it's odd to be talking about uh, uh, oral histories 30 years later. And, and we're heavily involved in doing this. Bud's, Bud's done one. There's many more to come. John Whitaker did one earlier this week. There's a week scheduled in New York. There's another week scheduled in Washington. Uh, uh, and we're deep into it. Uh, at the same time, uh, Whittier College, where, where I'm a trustee, has decided it will no longer ignore its most famous alum. And the new president has started a Richard Nixon fellowship program. And they have raised $200,000, and they're going to award uh, uh, internships, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, studying for a semester and then an internship uh, during the summer or winter break, but the theory is to get a, a number of students 
over to the library to do research on these papers that have, have been available but unexplored for 30 years. And, and, and the, uh, the reason I'm here talking now instead of later, as you may recall, I didn't do treatment, I helped do law enforcement. We drove people into treatment, so I don't get to participate in the, in the program today. But what I did do for the previous 30 years, I've hosted the policy planning reunion lunches, the annual reunion lunches of the Nixon staff. And so the really happy event with Tim Neftali is we know where all these people are and we can find them and get them to sit down and do the oral histories. What, what's so nice about this program that Bob and Jerry and Paul are putting on is they brought everybody together to do the same thing. So we at least will have treatment soon documented and then we can worry about law enforcement. Thank you. Let me just mention a couple of other things. Uh, Eric Wish is here. Eric, do you want to just stand up so everybody sees you? From CSER, the distinguished uh, program at the University of Maryland. And uh, on June 17th uh, of 2006, uh, we celebrated 35 years of drug czars. And we had uh, seven of the people who've been in that uh, role uh, at the meeting and had just a wonderful time, including our historians uh, here, David Musto and David Courtright, uh, at that meeting. And that has been put together as a DVD. Uh, it's available to anybody, the, the whole program. And it was a wonderful event. And Eric has got a special deal for all of you that instead of $75, $95, it's now $75. This is the brochure about it. And it's available back in the back for each of you to take a look at. I just, with the last thing, I just mention about this. I'm going to leave the, the books back there, too, that are, that are interesting. This is uh, Michael Massing's book, The Fix, which was the, the first time, I think, that anybody outside our little group recognized how unique the, the Nixon contribution was in drug policy and what an important uh, part of, of the history of American drug policy went on there. And we also, I also have uh, books here from a number of historians, including uh, uh, two books from David Courtright and also two from David Musto. And we're just very pleased uh, to have them uh, here with us also. Now, we are going to carry the program on, but we're going to uh, uh, move a little bit for a few minutes so Jerry's group gets his full hour and a half. I've taken up a few of the minutes, so, so you can add that on to your time uh, there. Uh, we're, we're, all of us had lives before, or say it up, and did all kinds of things before this happened. And in fact, one way to think about it is the way we got there was what we were doing before. Uh, and that's very important. But the world changed on June 17, 1971. And it's not often that you have a date that was so dramatic in terms of a change, a, a, a tipping point, if you, if you will, an inflection point in history, that that was very important. And then that, that event, that change that went on with executive order at that point, as we had the first White House drug czar, and this was elevated to become public enemy number one, the most important priority in the administration was the way it was announced. And then that was put into legislation with 92-255, the legislation that established the office from a legislative point of view and also established the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. And this is the anniversary of that event that we're celebrating now. So we are now 35 years from the time of the legislation that established the Special Action Office and, and NIDA. So our first panel is going to talk about how this came together, what happened, what those initial accomplishments were. And this was one of the most creative, uh, most important events uh, in the history of, of, of certainly of this, the creation of our field. And we're going to have the people who were there at the beginning who, who made it happen. And Jerry Jaffe is going to take care of this. Jerry? Yeah. I think Bob. Uh, I guess I need to thank you for coming, uh, especially those of you who have come a long way. I think Bob's comments prove the adage, if you wait long enough, somebody will do all the work for you. Uh, he said about everything I have to say, with uh, a couple of exceptions. 
Uh, I, I, I need to thank a few people for making this occasion possible. First, thanks to Bob DuPont, whose idea it was to have a reunion, and to Dick Booker for tracking down everybody uh, and all their email addresses, and he did the best he could without hiring a private detective. Uh, finally, Paul Perito and uh, Helen DuPont and Faith Jaffe and Jesse Lloyd, who works for Helen and Bob, and others who did all the heavy lifting. They found the venue, getting out invitations, keeping track of who was coming. Uh, let's see, what else? Creating the program, collecting and scanning photos for the video. Uh, we've turned it off, obviously. Uh, in inevitably, people will focus more on looking at their own picture <laughs> than anything anybody was going to say. So Helen had the good idea that perhaps we should turn it off. Now, Bob has told you uh, that what this occasion is, it's the 35th uh, anniversary of the passage of the Drug Abuse and Treatment Act of 1972. Waiting 35 years uh, has had some sad consequences. A number of our colleagues are no longer with us. And I'll mention those whose passing I know about. Dick Jordan, who was in charge of our public relations, uh, died fairly early. More recently, Grasty Cruz. Uh, then Bob Angarola, Bill Dirk, Eileen Angelari, Helen and Vince Nolis, David Nurko, and John Kramer. Uh, all of those were key players in uh, what we were able to accomplish. And uh, so we mourn their passing. Uh, you're, you'll see their pictures here. Um, as Bob mentioned, uh, that Drug Abuse Office and Treatment Act uh, was a life, had life-changing significance because a Democratic-controlled Congress endorsed the Nixon administration decision to change how our nation would deal with illicit drug use and with those who became addicted to them. Instead of emphasizing primarily law enforcement, the new policy aimed at a more balanced approach. Uh, and the new policy was actually announced on June 17, 1971. Uh, President Nixon uh, established that new office by executive order. Uh, the new office was given the mission to mobilize and coordinate all of the government's resources spread over 17 agencies, which dealt with treatment, rehabilitation, research, education, and prevention. The new director was appointed on that day and given the orders to knock heads together to get things done. At that point, the office had one employee. Actually, I wasn't an employee. I was still employed by the University of Chicago. It wasn't until the day before that I was told that I was going to do this job. And, uh, but within a matter of months, many of you uh, joined the effort to implement the new policy. And uh, I assume that uh, some of you have memories of that. You're going to hear some highlights of what led to the creation of the office and what happened over the next two years. So let me summarize what's going to be said, because uh, people may deviate from what I suggest they say. Uh, you know, as I've pointed out to everybody, as Ronald Reagan once said, I paid for this microphone. <laughs> There's nobody to boss us around. The time frame is a suggested one. The topics are suggested ones. But here's what was suggested. Uh, uh, that, that was, on June 17th, there was a seismic shift in policy. Uh, but it was with the result of more than two years of staff work and the two people most responsible for the work and for educating and persuading the top policymakers, including President Nixon, uh, about a need for a change were two young lawyers at the White House Domestic Council, Deputy Counsel to the President, Agel Bud Krog, and his Principal Assistant for Drug Problems, Jeffrey Donfeld. And uh, they're going to be here and give you some of their recollections. But like all seismic shifts in policy, it doesn't take place without some kind of precipitating event. And uh, in this case, the events were the ongoing heroin epidemic in the urban areas in the United States, the rise of the use of other drugs, and not the least, clear evidence of increasing heroin use among uh, servicemen in Vietnam. So Bud. And Jeff will tell us what led up to the present decision to create the office. And maybe Jeff will talk about persuading Bud. And uh, they'll probably actually talk to each other as much as to us 
uh, about what really happened. But drug use in Vietnam was the first hot topic. And in the first few weeks, just prior to June 17th, uh, the military began to implement some of the things that SADAP suggested. And what the military accomplished uh, regarding how it approached the problem was actually nothing short of miraculous in those three weeks. I mean, for me, it was an early version of shock and awe. Uh, but there remained much to be done. And without the efforts of a young army general, at least he was young back then, uh, say that his efforts in that area could not have been successful. And uh, Lieutenant General Robert Gard, now retired, is here to give us his perspective on those events. Now, the other thing that had to be done was to craft and negotiate a statutory authority for this office created by executive order. And that task fell to Paul Perito, who started as SEADAP's general counsel and subsequently became the deputy director. And uh, we're honored to have with us today, if, if he comes, uh, should be coming, the Honorable Paul Rogers, who was at the time the chairman of the subcommittee on health and uh, welfare of the House Interstate Foreign Commerce Committee. And his efforts were critical in the shaping of that SEADAP legislation. Paul also played key roles in confidentiality regs, in crafting a special kind of approval for methadone, uh, and changes in the code of military justice that were nece made necessary by the Vietnam intervention. From the very beginning, we knew how little we knew about uh, the causes of drug use, about epidemiology, about the effectiveness of various interventions, and we knew how much we had to stimulate research. Uh, and Dr. Alan Green, who's now professor and chairman of psychiatry at Dartmouth Medical School, and for a time my special assistant, will offer us some thoughts on the impact of SADAP's first two years on the scientific community. There are others here today who were uh, key consultants, and we probably couldn't have gotten along without our consultants. Uh, Benny Prim will be here shortly. Uh, John, Dr. John Ball is here. Um, uh, Chuck Wilson is here. Uh, some have called in. Uh, they couldn't make it, but uh, their thoughts are with us. Uh, and I hope that uh, they will uh, add during the discussion period to the memories of uh, that period. So I'm going to turn to my first speakers, uh, Bud Krogh and Jeffrey Donfeld. <laughs> what we thought we would do, uh, first of all, I want to thank Jerry and Bob and Nixon uh, Library. Is the Ford Library involved in this too? Or are they the Ford Library is also a sponsor. Ford, that's what I thought. The Ford Library is also a sponsor. And you know, looking around at people that I've seen uh, occasionally over the years, people we've worked with, uh, it's really almost for me like looking at a family of people that had a tremendous opportunity at a point in our history Can to put something together. Can you? You can understand. You got to I don't think those mics are on. Oh, you just lost it because it's not on. Testing. Ooh, wow, that's a deep, mellifluous voice coming through. Okay. Um, now can everybody hear? Okay. Uh, just to say, it's, it's like uh, coming back to a family that had the opportunity during a short period in our history to put something together that I think has had lasting value uh, for our country. When asked what I most enjoyed working on in the Nixon White House staff, uh, this is the topic of putting together uh, the drug program, uh, particularly helping to uh, put together the Special Action Office for Drug Abuse Prevention. And so thank you very much, you all, for putting this together and inviting us to come. What I thought we would do is Jeff and I will, will sort of tag team through the first couple of years because I think there's a, a, a number of points that need to be made uh, about how this all came about starting in 1969. Um, Jeff said that he did law enforcement, we did treatment, but I need to tell you this all started as a law enforcement notion. And I was in a meeting with um, the president, uh, must have been February of 1969, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to uh, respond to the campaign promise to uh, clean up crime around the country, and particularly in Washington, D.C., which was identified during the campaign as the crime capital of the world. 
And I remember being in a meeting with the president, he pointed to me and said, okay, bud, I want you to get after that. And so being dutiful, I took my yellow pad and said, you know, cut the crime uh, in the district you know, exclamation mark, and went back to my office and I called Walter Washington, the mayor of the district, some of you might remember, and I said, uh, Mr. Mayor, my name is Bud Krogh, I've just come from a meeting with the president, uh, he's asked me to, to get after the crime and I was wondering if you could go ahead and cut the crime and give me a call back when it's down. <laughs> And there was a long pause, uh, and he said, well, we'll get, we'll get right after that, uh, bud. Uh, um, thanks for the call, and there was a check off on my yellow pad, and I could go back to reading full field investigations from the FBI, which was my principal job in February 1969. Fast forward just a few short months, and I think the crime rate had gone from 169 uh, on the index, the FBI index per day to 202.4, which Ehrlichman called up from Clamp David and said, this is not progress. Uh, so uh, I was serious about it. I want you to get after this. So what we started doing is thinking through what are the strategies that might work. Uh, and frankly, we didn't have a very good clue at that point. Uh, one of the simple ones was let's add 1,000 police to the District of Columbia Police Department. So we put that in motion. And let's change the street lighting system. Let's change the legal system so that we have faster times from arrest to trial. A lot of the things that the law enforcement community thought would work. But then I think it happened, uh, I'm not sure exactly the date when we first met Bob. I guess it was late 69 uh, or the summer of 69. Yeah, I'm summer, of summer of 69. And you had started some of that research yeah. in the DC jail. And we were getting some information of uh, the correlation between uh, heroin use and the crimes that we were specifically trying to address in the District of Columbia. And I'm not sure how long that study took, but it became increasingly persuasive that if we could design a treatment set, uh, that we might be able to get after those who were the most likely people to commit crimes. What I'm pointing out is that this 1969 period was principally educational. We were learning what to do. And I will say that one of the, the magic parts of the Nixon administration, there were some areas where there was intense interest in making good policy. We were pragmatic. What worked? And it wasn't political. It wasn't how do we score political points for this, but what is the problem? What is the response to it that is the most intelligent? Who are the best people to carry it out? And there was a sense of almost policy humility that I think some of us had. We were open to suggestions and ideas. So I think what I just wanted to do a little bit about 69 and turn it over to Jeff in 69 because he worked on a number of different areas in, in drugs and then maybe we can move ahead into 70 and 71 because we're gonna try to take it up to 71. We're sort of sharing our 20 minutes, Jerry, if that's okay. Bud used the term uh, policy humility, and, and Bob said, well, we all had backgrounds before we got into the business, with uh, some exceptions. I knew nothing. And, and I think that that turned out to be a blessing, because I came to the issues with an absolutely clean slate, uh, not being involved either personally nor professionally in drug abuse. Uh, I was there to learn. And uh, I met Bob and uh, started to hear about something called methadone maintenance. And uh, Bob suggested that I visit a professor in Chicago by the name of Jerome Jaffe. And uh, I went to Chicago and I met Jerry. And as I traveled around the country at Bud's request to learn what was efficacious in this field, all all points went back to Jerry Jaffe. Uh, I learned about multimodality. Um, I visited the uh, psychotherapy programs, the halfway houses. And what Jerry kept drilling into my head was, look at the data, look at the data. And when I would go to the um, halfway houses and I'd ask for their data on recidivism, uh, I was always told that they were much too busy doing good things, treating the addicts to come up with data that just didn't seem to be high on their priority list. Whereas Bob and Jerry did have data which showed that methadone maintenance uh, indeed reduced uh, criminal recidivism, which as Bud mentioned was one of our primary goals. Uh, we were also very concerned about addiction of our soldiers in Vietnam. Uh, we were concerned that 
some people who were opposed to the Vietnam War would allege that uh, train killers would come back addicted to heroin, and we had to do something about that. And uh, at a proper point in this, uh, I'd like to tell about the story when Jerry and I went to the Pentagon uh, to deal with this issue. Do you want to pick up from here, or do you want me to continue with that mode? Uh, You're playing that should, we, should we pick up about well, let, let me Let me, uh, yeah. let me talk about um, how methadone maintenance um, was really introduced nationwide as, um, as a recognized treatment program. After doing this research, I put together a memo uh, for Bud and for John Ehrlichman, and uh, that ultimately led to a meeting in John Ehrlichman's office. Um, present at that meeting was Attorney General John Mitchell, uh, Jack Ingersoll, who was Director of Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, Elliot Richardson, who was then Secretary of HEW, and Bert Brown, who was then Secretary of National Institute of Ment Mental Health, or Director of National Institute of Mental Health, Bud Krogh, and myself. And um, I was debating uh, the efficacy of methadone maintenance. Um, Secretary Richardson and Director Brown were opposed to that because, in my view, they felt there'd be a diversion of money from um, the mental health uh, industry uh, to methadone maintenance. But I think that based upon um, the data that I was able to present, it became very clear that methadone uh, was an efficacious treatment along with other treatments, but it was certainly efficacious, and that ultimately led to um, the national adoption of methadone as a legitimate treatment modality. Okay, I think, and Jeff has taken us up to that point, but one of the things I was asked to do is to, how did President Nixon who you would not have thought would have been supportive of a major drug treatment initiative, how did he get there? And I remember being in a helicopter with him, leaving New York at one point. Um, I think Miles Ambrose was with me, and I was sitting next to the president, and he looked down, and he said, you know, bud, the people down there, they just want us to lock them up. He said, but we know better. Now, there's, he, he could see that the, the, the politics maybe were not flowing towards a massive drug treatment program, but he by that time had understood the value of treatment and what it could do. And it wasn't something where this happened with just two staff people working together. We were constantly informing John Ehrlichman. We would have meetings with the president where we, where we would explain what we were trying to do. Um, I met with the president after he resigned in 1976 and said, you know, I, I relied on you and Jerry Jaffe to tell me uh, what to do with, with drugs because that wasn't my specialty. He listened and then he would support us in the initiatives that we wanted to carry forward. I think that's a critical part of this that the president basically trusted us to give him good information on which he could rely. And as, as some of Bob's pictures will show, I mean the president was not an invisible presence in these meetings. I mean he came to them, he would go out to the press uh, and brief them with us. I mean, he was behind it. There's a little book called Heroes and Heroin, which is out of print right now, that describes the Vietnam initiative that the president was integrally involved in, and he was in meetings where he would question people. During that period of 69, 70, 71, I think the president began to understand more of what was at stake and to support it. With respect to Vietnam, the president had a drill down theory uh, and that was that the bureaucracy is probably going to lie to you. Um, and they will not tell you the scope of the problem. I remember a meeting with a certain admiral, which is, I probably should uh, keep nameless here, uh, where I asked him, how many addicts are there in the U.S. military? And he said, well, we've got about 100. And, um, and I felt like saying, is that in the Anacostia facility, you know, or is that, but, but I was a young aide and didn't feel that was an appropriate question, as he was an admiral. And I said, how do you determine that number? He said, well, we count out how many we have actually incarcerated and convicted. I said, I think the population is a little bit larger than that. At which point I went to Ehrlich and I said, I don't think we're going to get an accurate answer from the military. Now, this is 1970. This is before all this happened. The president approved a trip uh, for me and John Lehman to go to Vietnam. And we started at the demilitarized zone. We went to 13 fire bases. 
I remember getting off a helicopter in one fire base in the northern part of South Vietnam near the DMZ, dressed in fatigues, went over to a group of guys who were sitting by a half track looking off into the jungle, and I said, uh, hi guys, um, I'm Bud Krogan, I'm from the White House. And one of these guys took a toke on a joint, and he puffed it, and he said, I'm from Mars. Um, <laughs> and so I, we, we had some commonality there probably in terms of, uh, so I said, where can I get this uh, marijuana? He said, what kind do you want? And, uh, and I said, well, what's available? So, well, you can get this down here and the rest. And, and as Jeff found out himself in one of his trips, getting out of a car, somebody tried to sell him a vial of heroin. I found out that it was widespread. The availability was widespread. And I remember coming back and briefing the president. And I said, you don't have a drug problem in South Vietnam. And he said, well, I, I don't. I don't. I said, no, sir. You have a condition. I said, this is not something we are going to solve. But there are other measures that we can take that perhaps will ameliorate that uh, condition that's going on there. That was a very important session with him. Because before that, we thought we have law enforcement uh, resources that we can make use of. We didn't have that in South Vietnam. They're fighting a war over there. Um, I think maybe, Jeff, do you want to? Yeah, let me seg segue yeah, into that. Uh, very shortly after Jerry's introduction to the president at the Oval Office, uh, Jerry and I went to the Pentagon to meet in a um, very Im imposing uh, conference room with generals and admirals. Now, here are two young Jewish guys. Uh, we didn't know whether you saluted with the right hand or the left hand. And uh, here we were with, um, the room was full of generals and admirals, as, as I recall. And uh, Jerry said, look, we need to find a way to identify our soldiers in Vietnam who are dependent on drugs. And the generals and admiral, admirals, many of whom were physicians, said, well, there is no technology available in the United States, nor to our knowledge anywhere in the world, to identify those that are dependent on heroin. And Jerry said, well, I think that there is. And they said, no, there isn't. And, and Jerry set up an ambush. And, and the ambush was, uh, if I can find you the technology, can I have a couple of C5As to fly uh, machines over to Vietnam? Uh, they very confidently said, sure. And Jerry's next question was, is there a speakerphone in this conference room? Oh, sure there is. And Jerry goes to the speakerphone, dials up some friends or colleagues that he knew about in Palo Alto who had developed these urine analysis machines which were able to identify or analyze a drug sample within a minute. So Jerry gets these folks on the phone. Do you have a such and such machine? Yes, we do. Uh, would you tell us what the technical capabilities are? And they repeated all that, get off the phone. Jerry said, when can I have the C5As? And uh, those machines were loaded on at Moffett Air Force Base, flown over to, was it Benoit? Long Ben. Long Ben, yeah. where the machines were set up. And uh, shortly after those machines were set up, the team of us went over to Vietnam, but you yeah. met us over there, and um, I flew out to um, one of the fire bases to watch the procedure where our soldiers, um, on a haphazard basis, were asked to give urine samples. But, you know, one has to ask, well, what was, just, what was the purpose of identifying the soldiers? It was not for the purposes of punishment. It was not for the purpose of court martials, but rather to identify them and help them and part of the mission of the Special Action Office was to develop uh, teams that would go out to the military and to the VA hospitals and train folks as to how to treat uh, these people, our soldiers who became dependent on drugs. Can you put a date on when that was? Uh, the meeting that they had was probably May 30th, 1971. And there was another meeting uh, that followed up. Jeff came back after that session with Jerry and said, here's what we can do. Here's the reaction that we got over in the Pentagon. And I reported to the president on that. And he said, well, I would like to have you set up a meeting with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and all the chiefs, the service secretaries, the secretary of defense, uh, the deputy secretary of defense for manpower and reserve affairs, the attorney general, Don Rumsfeld, Ehrlichman, and you, and I want you in, uh, to run this meeting. Now, you're a young aide in the White House staff, and you come into a breakfast meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning, 
And Sam, thank you. I've gone through the notes of that meeting recently out at the archives. It's an incredible meeting. And there you have all this brass and the service secretaries. Jerry and Jeff had already given us a, a roadmap of what to do, and we briefed the president. President turns to Mel Laird and he said, Mr. Secretary, how many addicts do you think we've got in the military? He said, about 100, sir. <laughs> so, so, so the education of the, the top brass was to begin. And that was an amazing meeting. Uh, the president used extremely strong language backed up on what Jeff said. He said, we have to break this notion that our troopers come back addicted to heroin. They're dangerous junkies that can't hold jobs. It was politically becoming difficult for the president. And that meeting was on June 3rd. Now, look at the timing here. End of May 1971, they go to the Pentagon. June 3rd, the president meets with the secretaries and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And if you've ever heard a president give direct orders, I mean, he told Jerry about knocking heads together, which I think came because he liked your tie. I think in that meeting it was really an amazing tie that Jerry was wearing. But anyway, so that was the 3rd of, 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 of uh, June, 1971. And we fast forward to the 16th and the 17th. I think Jerry came to Washington, D.C. on the 16th, uh, not knowing what uh, amazing opportunity lay ahead of him. Uh, this is called recruitment by ambush. And uh, I don't think that we could have done it any other way because then you would have asked Faith in the interim and she would have said, are you crazy? Wouldn't you have Faith? Would you have said, yes, you would have asked that question as, as a, a rational person would. Um, but I remember going into that meeting with the president, I believe it was on, was it the 16th or it was 17th? Because we didn't give you much time to, to think. The 16th, and the president said, we're glad that you have accepted this opportunity. I wrote the talking points uh, for that. Um, and I don't think you had a full change of clothes beforehand uh, to be before the next day. And then one of the pictures that Bob has is of the four of us standing there. There's, uh, there's Jerry and uh, John Ehrlichman and the president uh, and myself. When we presented the Special Action Office for Drug Abuse Prevention, uh, laid out what its mission was going to be. Uh, Jerry was presented as, as the new director. Now, it might look sudden, but it wasn't. There was a, a big, uh, a, a lot of work that had gone on beforehand to develop what we were going to do. But that was sort of the launch. Jeff? Yeah, I think there's a, another important observation to be made, and that is, you know, before we put together all of our thoughts with regard to the Special Action Office, uh, we, we traveled around the country to try to learn what was out there. Uh, we tried to gather ideas, and, and one of the impediments that I ran into was a reticence of the um, healthcare delivery system to cooperate with the Nixon administration because we were perceived as right-wing nutcases, law enforcement-oriented folks were, who were not concerned. That was Jeff Shepard, not a, a, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I was trying to be polite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, folks who were not concerned with issues of confidentiality. Uh, I think there were times when we were accused of um, trying to commit genocide by uh, switching the addiction from heroin to methadone. Uh, we were trying to subjugate the black community. All of, all of these accusations were just the furthest from the truth because we did not come to the task with any ideological preconceptions. We really had carte blanche to do what we felt was best for America and for a health care problem. And I think that it was only as a result of Jerry Jaffe uh, legitimizing what we were doing because Jerry had such a great reputation in the healthcare delivery community that people said, well, if Jerry's involved, maybe it's okay. And, and that allowed uh, Jerry and, and, and some of his colleagues to put together a very thoughtful paper that uh, really laid the, frown, the, the, the um, framework for the thoughts that were ultimately uh, found their way into SEODAP. In fact, that paper came in in December of 1970. As I say, it was an educational process, 69, 1970. I think Burt Brown's group did a paper in 1970. Jerry's group did a paper. And it moves into 1971, but it wasn't until two congressmen, Robert Steele and Morgan Murphy, went to Vietnam, came back with a very high percentage rate of servicemen who were addicted to heroin, that we had a political problem. 
And so the time was sort of compressed from their trip, which I think was March or April of 1971, uh, April, to May, to Jerry's meeting with, with Jeff over at the Pentagon, the president's meeting, the presentation of SEODAP in June, June of 1971. Um, I think that um, the Vietnam experience, I mean, for some of us, and by the way, that your analysis program was the pea house of the August moon, yes. uh, was, in, was, in, was in Long Bin, which I thought was a catchy phrase. Um, turned out to be extremely successful. And one thing I wanted to point out is that it was transparent what we did. There was nothing secret. Uh, we would have meetings. We would invite the press to come in. Uh, that book I mentioned, Heroes and Heroine, came out of an ABC special that Av Weston, who was the director of that uh, company, wanted to do. And we, we were very open about what we knew and what we didn't knew didn't know. And when we came back from Vietnam for that trip that we were on together, uh, we first briefed the president, and Bob's got a picture of us briefing the president there in San Clemente, and we went immediately out and briefed the press. Here's what we found out. Here's what we saw. And you know, there's nothing more boring than the government coming out and saying, here's what we're trying to do. We did pretty well here, made some mistakes here. We're going to fix it. We're going to move on. They got, okay, uh, no blood there. Let's move on to something else. But I think having it be transparent was very helpful to us and helped create the conditions where then once we had presented the office by executive order, we could then turn to our colleagues on the Hill, Paul Perito particularly, who did, I think, one of the most magical pieces of legislative drafting and getting support for it that I have ever seen. And I hope, uh, Bob, and I don't know if we have a picture of it, of Nixon smiling in the uh, East Room of the White House in June of 1972, which is the day that we're honoring today, when that was presented to the country as, I think, one of the most, well, think about this, a, a, an issue like drugs ranked number two or three and most important in the country, going through the Senate, and I, maybe I'm stealing your thunder here, I should be quiet. Yeah, I am. But he said it's okay. He's going to say Oh, but he's, I'm going to set it up. What's he going to say? Outrank him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I'll be quiet and let Paul carry this out. But uh, all, all I can say is I rarely saw Nixon genuinely smile in a meeting. But I'll tell you, when, when this one came down in June of 1972, there was a big smile on his face for what he was able to sign. Now, that's not taking too much of it, is it, Jerry? Okay. One extra comment, though. Uh, the difficulty with 35 years is you begin to remember things differently. I, rem <laughs> I remember what happened at the uh, Pentagon, just a little bit different than Jeff. Uh, I did not set up an ambush. Uh, it was absolute ignorance of what I was supposed to do that allowed us to roll over the military. Uh, and I didn't say, just give me. They said they couldn't possibly get the machines there. I said. Get me a telephone, I'll get some civilians and we'll go. Actually, at the end, we actually did recruit some civilians. You've seen their pictures. And we went over there. But uh, I was being very sincere. It was not a trap. Uh, uh, He's good, isn't he? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Jerry, this is for history, remember. Posterity. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't need votes anymore. Yeah, no, I, I, I always try to be honest about these things. Anyway. Really, and, not under yeah. <laughs> yeah. and I can well, tell you that is a good thing. <laughs> but the, the military did a magnificent job. Uh, I do want to make one other point. When we got to San Clemente, the president said, you know, from the tragedies of war, this is, I think he, these were his words, we often make major advances in medicine. And I want you to write a book about this. Well, I looked at it, and I, I looked at the, 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 the kind of distrust that people had uh, with government at the time. It was the Vietnam War and a variety of other things. And I said, you know, if, if I actually write some of this, nobody will believe it. We hired Lee Robbins to do the follow-up of Vietnam. And uh, Dr. Eric Wish is here. He worked with Lee Robbins then. We have a copy of the report she did. It is a landmark study of the natural history of heroin addiction, and it has never been repeated since, uh, never existed prior to that time. And uh, 
she did publish it, and it was important. It told us a lot. Uh, maybe we'll get to that again. But I think our next speaker is actually uh, General Bob Gard. Uh, he's now a lieutenant general. He was only a brigadier then. But he was a key player. And without the cooperation of the agencies that we were supposed to oversee, we really couldn't do anything. All we could do is fire Mel Laird, do that. But that wouldn't get anything done. Unless they cooperated, we couldn't get anything done. And I think uh, Bob Gard will tell us a little better what it was like to be on the receiving end. He's going to come up to the mic here. He asked me to come up here because. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. By the way, a, a footnote on the, the heroin use in Vietnam. I went there in 68, and there was a lot of marijuana use. By the time I left in 69, you could walk around my fire bases, and it would crunch under your feet because they were the little vials. It only cost five bucks uh, for 96% concentrated heroin. It was, and it was quite wide, widespread in 69. You're absolutely right. Uh, I was at the Council on Foreign Relations in 1970-71, uh, convinced that my first assignment as a brand new brigadier would be something grand about strategy, uh, since this was all foreign policy discussion and so on. And there was a picture in the New York Times, that's why I was curious about the date. And it was President Nixon and the Joint Chiefs, it must have been the, that same meeting that you described. And they're all looking very somber, and the caption underneath, I don't know if you remember this, but it said, the president is discussing with the Joint Chiefs of Staff the forthcoming national counteroffensive against drug abuse. And as I said to my colleagues, the council, I said, you know, this means some poor SOB is going to be <laughs> jumping through his, all sorts of hoops to get done uh, tomorrow what should have been done a year ago. I can't remember the exact details, but it wasn't much it wasn't much longer after that that I got my phone call from the general officer branch and uh, they said, sir, we have your assignment. I said, great, what is it? I said, you're going to introduce the drug program to the United States Army. I said, you've got to be kidding me. No, and you have to be down here in two days. You're going to get frocked. That means they put the star on your shoulder even though your number's not up yet. You don't get paid for it. but." Uh, the word from the White House, as I understood it, was each service had to have a general officer. So I sh dutifully showed up in the office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel, my three-star boss, who pinned the stars on. And sure enough, he said, we usually give you the day off when you make general, but you're so far behind. And he said, you know, your office is, and go back there and get to work. Well, I had... Uh, in my little drug office, two people, a chaplain and a shrink. Uh, the shrink's name was Brian Doyle, and I just had breakfast with him about two months ago. He ran me down, and we were recalling all this. I was called the Director of Discipline and Drug Policies. I had crime, war crime, dissent, all of those uh, happy functions, me lie, Tony Herbert, and by the way, you got to get a drug program going. There's some guy named Jerry Jaffe over in the White House that's really given us a lot of, a lot of grief. Well, I, I remember calling the Surgeon General. Turned out he didn't know anything. Nobody taught them in medical school in those days anything about drugs. Um, so. I, I realized the abysmal level of ignorance, starting with me, about this whole problem. So I asked my two drug staff people, I said, go find me the best drug education program in the United States. And we got to start from the top, and we got to put uh, teams together and train trainers of trainers so we can get the word down to help this huge institution get at least some basic understanding of the nature of this problem. Now, one advantage, uh, paradoxically, to the political emphasis on this coming out of the White House and the abysmal ignorance throughout the Army about the nature of the problem was everybody left me alone. 
I didn't get a lot of guidance from my three-star boss. He basically said, without using these words, go get this done, do what you need to do, and don't bother me with it. So I had freedom of action happily. Uh, I do remember the early days of the urinalysis screening program when the soldiers would say, sir, I don't know what they're talking about. Somebody must have put that stuff in my Coca-Cola at my farewell party. And we did have some problems with the labs, didn't we, Jerry? Uh, false positives and false negatives. That's why and you had the gas chromatography. <laughs> <laughs> and I understood you could buy a clean urine for five bucks uh, at one point. I thought it was 10. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the, the way the commands reacted when the word got out, they said, look, uh, I, this is literally one of the calls I got from one of the major four-star commanders. Look, you take those people from Vietnam that are using this stuff, and you put them on an island someplace in the Pacific until you clean them up before you send them to me. Well, of course, we had no option. You had to have a drug rehabilitation program at every major installation in the United States Army. I'll never forget one of the first um, three-week sessions we had for, the, the United States used to be dry, uh, divided up in Army areas. This was Sixth Army. And to make the point, I, I had the, the, the uh, Sixth Army uh, three-week session done at Esalen Institute, if some of you know what that is. And they had a brand new building and you had to take your shoes off before you went in there. So when I marched in as a runny-nosed brigadier general and sour-looking senior generals sitting there with their shoes off, and, and um, it was uh, it was really remarkable. The the by the way, the the best drug education program that my staff came up with was at Princeton University. And we, we had them as a traveling team going around the world, starting with the major commands. And, and in, U in Europe, we did it for each of the divisions as, as well as US Army Europe. And then we worked to establish some kind of program so that the people who got dried out in Vietnam in the detox ward, instead of bringing them back and discharging them right away, we, we tried to help them get their heads on a little bit before we sent them out. And that was the start of what took a while, as you might expect, to get instituted as a part of the, part of the Army's kind of understandable philosophy on, on how you deal with these kind of people. By the way, uh, to show you the extent to which they at least gave me my head. I was able to get my title change from Director of Discipline and Drug Policies to Director of Human Resources Development in less than a year. Now, that's, an, that's old hat now, but let me tell you, it was a bit of a revolution in those days. And what we tried to do, and, and I personally spent a lot of time writing the Army regulation, was, was to make it a human resources development project, namely give people constructive alternatives, athletics. I even took transcendental meditation from the Marishi myself. Because had I gone out in that army regulation and said one of the things you ought to do is make TM available, kids were into, into that in those days, you know, they'd have carted me off. Uh, but I actually took it. The Marishi, by the way, is tough as nails. I did a thing for him at MIT, and I did it in uniform and explained what we were trying to do with the drug program. And somebody in the audience waggled his finger at the Marishi. How can you let a war criminal come up here? And the Marishi laid him out. There is no profession more noble than the military. They are there to prevent war. I mean, you could have you etched that on the Pentagon. I had no more problems with advocating <laughs> <laughs> transcendental meditation. Um, well, 
it, it, it was slow going at first. The other big issue I had, other than not sending these people on an island until we got them all cured, was that I refused to call it a drug and alcohol program uh, in the Army. Um, I called it a drug program of which alcohol was one of the drugs, much to the consternation of a good deal of the careerists. Trying to make a point, I asked my shrink, I said, Brian, go find out whether or not marijuana, which was just sort of everybody using it in those days, find out that if we were going to have a social drug to, to lubricate cocktail parties, would we pick marijuana or would we pick alcohol, which is worse? Well, I don't know what the answer to that is, but Brian came back and told me, he said, we probably pick marijuana because it's less dangerous than alcohol. And that was a way of trying to get some credibility with uh, the young soldiers who uh, perceived people who were addicted to alcohol as in, in many ways in more trouble than those uh, that were addicted to other drugs. Well, Jerry, I don't know if I did what you wanted me to, but, but we, we were able, with your, your direct participation, I remember your helping me out from time to time, uh, I think we were able to do something that was constructive that ha has benefited the Army greatly. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, might say that one of our problems with the generals, of course, was their only concern was getting them out of the outfit. But if you're a soldier in Vietnam and all you have to do is come up with a positive urine to get out of the outfit and there were no adverse consequences, then they would be selling the positive urines for $15 right. rather than the negative <laughs> urines. I tried to convince them of that and I think we did because we set it up so that they understood what the issues were. Uh, the, the next major task, of course, is how do you legitimize methadone, which was opposed by some people in the, our bureaucracy? How do you get uh, statutory authority for an office? Uh, and how do you do a number of other things to really do all the things that the president wanted? And I think Paul, uh, my deputy, will uh, had that task. And he's going to tell you how we did all of these things in 10 minutes, because he's always very brief and concise. <laughs> As a young uh, member of parliament, and a, a then a backbencher in the 1920s, Winston Churchill in viewing the often uh, absurd and cacophonous legislative process of the parliament, uh, used uh, the expression of Otto von Bismarck to describe what he was a participant in. A person having respect for either sausage or legislation should watch neither being made. Uh, anybody who has had the joy or challenge of trying to work something through the hill to to emerge with a piece of legislation intact inevitably comes to the conclusion that every day on Capitol Hill is Halloween. In contradistinction, <laughs> in contradistinction to that concept, uh, some fascinating events occurred on June 18, 1971, and ties in what Bud and uh, Jeff alluded to. The President sent up the Sayodap bill, and it was a surprisingly bipartisan initial response that greeted that document. But as I who had the responsibility for, for taking this then very sparse outline and making it into uh, a viable structure. Um, I was struck by the fact that the director of this office was vested with enormous power um, in an office which had enormous authority. Indeed, one way to interpret that authority was 
that this non-political person could override nine, 10, or 12 separate cabinet or uh, agencies. And as the, as the original draft reflected that if it were enacted, it could even supersede the jealously uh, possessed prerogatives of OMB. Uh, never in my life, um, in my former life on the Hill as Chief Counsel uh, and Staff Director of the House Select Committee on Crime, had I ever seen bipartisan support for such a broad grant of executive power. My job was to get it through. What was intriguing is when you look at the introducers on both sides of the aisle, you saw that there was an opportunity to ride the wave of what Bud and Jerry and Jeff have referred to. There were three phenomenal issues at that time that captivated the Congress and captivated the American people. Aside from the economy, it was Vietnam, drugs, and street crime. And inevitably, drugs and street crime were linked. And that's what I attempted to build the House around. The Percy Bill, Senate 2089, was introduced the first day on the, on the 18th by 17 senators, nine of whom were Democrats. And they ran the political stripes from very liberal to very conservative. You had a Humphrey and you had a, a, a Goldwater on the same bill. Within one day after that bill was submitted, you had 17 additional sponsors, nine of whom were Democrats. Um, let me quote from Abe Ribicoff, a statement that he made, a very, very liberal Democrat. He said the president made a bold and courageous decision to take a balanced and health-oriented approach to what clearly was a national problem. Similar statements of praise came from Senator Byrd from West Virginia, Senator Hughes from Iowa, and Senator Muskie of Maine. On the House side, who introduced the bill, a Republican? No, Harley Staggers, chairman of the Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee, along with Bill Springer, a Republican. Within two days of their introduction, virtually the entire committee of Democrats and Republicans were co-sponsors. I took a look at this, and I knew that dangerous waters were coming. The year before this happened, there had been bruising battles on the Hill to enact what was known as the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. PL 91-513, a landmark piece of supply side, of supply side legislation that ultimately was adopted in 38 states. Um, and I, I remember reading uh, from a young professor who uh, sent me a book when I took this responsibility from a, an opinion of Justice Holmes, his first opinion in the high court, he said, one page of history is worth a thousand pages of logic. I was on notice that problems were about to occur. Um, what I found astounding, looking at it from the perspective that I thought would help me most, namely as a former senior prosecutor in the US Attorney's Office in New York, and as a former Democratic chief counsel of a committee, was to take this unique confluence of events. Astounding, a Republican president had astutely seized what traditionally had been a Democratic-oriented health issue. My judgment, it was roughly due to the creative and comprehensive staff work of these two gentlemen here. I thought that it would never happen but for good staff work on the Senate side, the bill was referred at first to the Government Operations Committee, but everybody anxious to share a limelight with Jerry and the media frenzy 
under the banner, which I thought was an unfortunate metaphor at the time of the war on drugs, claimed jurisdiction of five other committees and three subcommittees. On the House side, although originally referred to foreign and interstate commerce, there was a champion uh, that I thought that I could cultivate because of our relationship when we worked on the Controlled Substances Act, Paul Rogers. Paul Rogers was regarded as the most knowledgeable and, and experienced health-oriented person in the Congress. Not surprisingly, committees like education, appropriation, defense, education, all claimed a jurisdictional nexus. The result? Approximately 37 public hearings over a nine plus, uh, plus month period from June 18, 71 until May 16, 72. Interestingly enough, I went back to my lawyer's notes, which I always used to keep. From the period of June 1871 through April 73, Jerry and or I had 112 Senate and House testimonial appearances. We got, everybody wanted a piece of this action. And as Bob Gard referred to, the, the, the Vietnam issues captivated the concern and interest of the Congress. And I can remember Tip O'Neill from Massachusetts and Silvio Conti calling me in the office and says, you know, we're all from Massachusetts and so on and so forth. You got a problem here, young man. You're going to have a generation of new addicts. So I painstakingly went through the process of explaining to him how Dr. Jaffe was going to change that. <laughs> and divine intervention, I thought, at that time. But uh, we never would have gotten, Jerry and I never would have gotten through those appearances but for the staff work of people like Dick Buca, Dr. Buca, Dr. Green, Dick Glass, Jeff Donfell, and others, who really, who really, as Bud said, I think were, were colorblind to everything but the mission. And, and that was incredibly reassuring. And frankly, I think one of the things that helped Jerry and I so much is that we did have a free hand in bringing in the best and the brightest. Um, what surprised me, and frankly astounded me, was that some of the most fierce lobbying efforts that I encountered were not from the group of psychiatrists who wanted to protect their realm in the community men health centers, were not from some of the workers who thought that they were going to be laid off from therapeutic communities, they, but they were from some senior officials at NIAMH. And some of the community mental health advocates attempted to convince uh, the Congress that the administration of methadone for treatment, of, and they suggested at first for both detoxification and treatment, would produce counterproductive, indeed, they said, disastrous results. And I asked the same question. Show me the data. Well, interestingly enough, these mental health types had no data because, as they said to me, we're too busy doing God's work. I said, well, you know, sometime, you know, in God we trust, all others pay cash. You know, you have to come up and show me the money. I mean, you got all this money from grants. And one of the things that I think they feared about Jerry was that he was talking this bizarre animal of fee for service. Somehow we wanted accountability for the money being spent to treat patients. And I must say, uh, I was shocked at some appearances that I made before Congress that there were pickets outside. And Jerry and I were, quote, dedicated methadone mavens, or we were committed to enslaved neighborhoods by methadone treatment. On the positive side, Several members of Congress wanted to clarify the authority. They wanted to avoid conflict. And they wanted to enlarge our jurisdiction over the civil service that, where they thought there were drug abuse problems. They wanted to provide 
aspects of the DOD with some additional help, and they were concerned about whether, in fact, if people volunteered for treatment and they were in the military and they had been drafted, not, not volunteered for service, would there be civil rights problems if, in fact, there wasn't proper confidentiality? That was one of the germinal factors that really moved us to focus on the confidentiality regs. Um, the other issue that constantly uh, I confronted was the attempt to expand the authority of SEADAT into the law enforcement area. And I'll never forget um, Tip O'Neill and, and Silvio Conti and a few of the Massachusetts Democrats that I met with said, you know, we had Jack Ingersoll up here, and he said he's got the problem in hand. And I said, well, uh, I guess he's now living on another planet, because if the problem was in hand, I don't think the president would do what we say we're going to do, what, we, what he says has to be done. I said, the Jack Ingersoll issue and the issue of uh, law enforcement has really been initially handled by, by truly a landmark piece of legislation, the Controlled Substances Act. And I said, what, what you need is you need a coordinated response. That's, that's what this bill is all about. And, you know, as someone who uh, was accustomed to representing the government as a client or the Congress as a client, um, I suddenly saw that, frankly, uh, the best chance I had of convincing the Congress to move rapidly was to encourage as much exposure to Jerry, uh, and Jerry didn't know this, uh, as possible because I saw in Jerry as a client, and I looked at my role first in the administration as a client, but secondly as Jerry as the client, um, that Jerry's medical and clinical expertise and professional demeanor would be a, a refreshing change from the conventional administration witnesses, both on the Republican and Democratic side, for whom the Congress and the staff were accustomed to. Canned messages, non-responses, Jerry was incapable, incapable of not being refreshingly blunt <laughs> and was an articulate spokesman for, uh, for clinical treatment and research issues for which he had unparalleled knowledge. And, and I'll never forget, I got called into Senator Hughes' office with the staff and we were talking about this and Hughes called me aside and said, you know, even though I am an al was an alcoholic and still is an al I am an alcoholic and, and I went cold turkey, um, I believe that Dr. Jaffe, unlike any other person that I've met in the treatment milieu, can, can turn this problem around because he has an approach that although I don't necessarily embrace it intellectually, I can support it because I know he's an honest and straightforward fellow. Um, this protracted process uh, got moved along when we convinced them that on the law enforcement side, this had been taken care of and we would have an assistant director who would have coordinating responsibility and that the national strategy that was required, there would be intergovernmental meetings which Jerry would convene. As it turned out, we were able to force votes then in both committees and in the subcommittees, the Senate passed S-2097 first by an astounding vote of 92 to 0. Uh, subsequently, on the House side, uh, a, a clean bill was forced out on 1289, and that passed 380 to 0. Can you imagine today or 10 years ago having anything in the Congress agreed upon something particularly for a landmark piece of legislation where there were no dissenting votes. When the President 
signed this bill into law, and, and Bud and Jerry uh, uh, alluded to this. I went back to the original transcript because, you know, that's that horrible training at the Harvard Law School, you know. At Yale, it's uh, never look at the statute unless the legislative policy is unclear. But, but, but at Harvard, we, look, we learned to look at the statute. The president said there wasn't a vote against this bill in either House or Senate, and there are not many I sign like this. Indeed, few presidents ever have the opportunity to sign these bills. The president then turned away, looked at the first two rows, and looked down at the members of the cabinet who were, who were assembled there, and he said, quote, I've given Dr. Jaffe, I've given Dr. Jaffe, when I made this appointment of him in this office, the responsibility of knocking the heads together, the heads together, and unless the people in government and all of you in the agencies, and I'm looking at you today, are cooperating and work together. Instead of heads being knocked together, heads will roll. I give this man this responsibility. That's his statement. Now, seldom has such license and authority ever been given, and political muscle ever been given to a non-political person who did not even have cabinet status. And although Jerry and I sometimes quietly, or not so quietly, disagreed on a whole series of issues when I would say, look, you have to pull your gun out of the holster. We never disagreed on the worthiness of the health-oriented mission or the concept that uh, the people's treatment dollars had to be accounted for. Um, i just say two other brief words, one on, on the DOD situation. We, we had to resolve to draft confidentiality regs because it was clear that we, at the same time that we had to amend Title 10, and as the general knew, if you took the traditional title of the U.S. Code that governed military conduct, if you come in and admitted you were an addict, then you'd be subject to a process in which it would either be court-martial or dis dishonorable discharge, and we were concerned about that. Jerry's theory was, look, you have to have people volunteer as well as people who are come up on a urine screen, and what if we have a false positive? So that's one of the reasons, and ultimately, fortunately, we were able to convince the general counsel and Secretary Leard to the amendments. The White House was terrifically helpful in that. And uh, at the same time, we also had to legitimize the concept within the structure of the FDA of a treatment regimen using methadone. And so the methadone regs were a product of cooperation between the White House and Peter Hutt, uh, who was then general counsel, now uh, uh, teaching part-time as a professor at Harvard, a brilliant, brilliant lawyer. Um, we came up with something that they first said, when we talked about it, they said, Perito, I don't know whether it's you or Hutt who's crazy. We said a hybrid INDNDA. And so that the research only concept was changed. And so we, we, we came up with this, essentially providing a base so that licensed practitioners uh, could prescribe this in certain regimens. Um, this was unprecedented. But since that time, similar practices have been adopted in 30 countries. The final concept is, uh, as I look back, what we participated in was uh, a unique government experiment, uh, a bold and imaginative one by the White House. And all this couldn't have occurred but for, not for us, we, we worked with the incredible people we had, and the people sitting in this room, and the other people who couldn't make it, and the other people who were not with us, those thoughtful and dedicated to skill, skilled professionals gave us the privilege of leading them. But this would have never been achieved without a team effort, and it was a terrific team effort. And Jerry and I will forever be indebted to all of you. Thank you. Well. We're going to hear next from uh, Professor Alan Green about his perception of what happened on the research uh, side of things. And uh, 
Dr. Benny Prim has joined us, and I'm going to ask him to say a few minutes after that about what happened out there uh, in the streets in terms of how this impacted treatment in the communities. Uh, so think about five minutes worth spending. Uh, give me a lot of preparation like they gave me for that first White House. Book. And uh, Dr. Prim. Heads, heads will roll. I, re I remember that being in that room, hearing that. This is like a, uh, a family meeting. I'm a psychiatrist, and uh, it's like a family meeting. You know, when, when, you, when you have a uh, family gets together after 20 years, you have a family reunion. Everybody sits at, the, at their old seat at the table, and everybody resumes their former behavior. So I'm still the special assistant to Jerry <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> and, 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 and uh, it really feels like that. I, I was a 27-year-old kid. Um, I was uh, working in a, a research laboratory at the NIMH. Uh, actually, Jerry probably doesn't know this, what I was uh, working on was uh, morphine. I was interested in how morphine worked. And, and I was, uh, was house-sitting for my uncle, who had a house here. Uh, they were traveling, and I was house-sitting. And I was, uh, so I had these rats. And, I, and you, couldn't, you can't do this now, but I took these rats from the laboratory and was uh, injecting them every six hours with morphine to addict them to morphine, and I kept them in a bathroom in, in the house. So, uh, so you see there were all these rats there in cages and needles and so forth, and uh, my cousin, the uncle's son, came to visit, unbeknownst to me, he comes in <laughs> and sees these rats and the morphine vials and the needles. He calls up his father and said, we got problem here. My cousin, your nephew, is seriously involved with drugs. So this is why, this is a true story. So, um, so I'm, I'm working on, on morphine and I, I get a call from a, a, a former mentor of mine from medical school uh, saying, uh, this fellow Jerry Jaffe was just appointed as the drug czar. Well, I actually knew it because I had seen it in the New York Times. And so he said, uh, I had heard from Jerry Jaffe, and Jerry Jaffe said he only had one person working with him and that he was the, the person, and he needed some help. And would I be interested in possibly uh, going to meet Jerry Jaffe? And I think we had met once before at a meeting or something. I, didn't, I really didn't know him at all. Um, I said, sure, uh, and uh, I called up Jerry's office, and uh, someone said he was in Vietnam or something, and that uh, I didn't know why he'd be there, but he was in Vietnam, and that uh, I could see him in maybe a week or 10 days. So I took the week or 10-day period. Jerry probably doesn't know this as well. I actually called up some friends and said, now, I've got to learn something about drug abuse, because I really don't, I, I mean, I know about this morphine and these rats, but I had had a, an internship in medicine. I, uh, uh, but, you know, as, as other people said in medical school, you don't learn about drug abuse, or at least you didn't then. And so I went and visited drug abuse programs and became an expert in about three days. And so then I went to meet Jerry in his uh, office in the new executive office building. He's sitting there with all these flags behind him. I thought this was pretty impressive. And uh, he said to me, well, if you come and join me, we'll make a difference. So how could I refuse? So I, so I joined him. It took, uh, it took a couple of months uh, before the bureaucracy figured out how to transfer me from the NIMH to the uh, White House. And, uh, so in September 71, I joined SEADAP, I joined the team, and I was Jerry's, as, as he said, I was his special assistant. Well, I, did. I was 27 years old, I had never had a secretary, I didn't know what a special assistant was, so I asked Perito. I said, what's a special assistant? He says, well, uh, you do whatever needs to be done, but basically you follow Jerry around and keep things straight. <laughs> Little did I know that that was impossible. <laughs> not so easy. So a few months later, my work, uh, actually the very, one of the first days we got, we got a call from someone in New York. Jerry was supposed to be speaking in New York, but unfortunately he was in Washington, and we had apparently lost the invitation. So my first job was setting up the mail room, as you may remember, and uh, Jerry, had, Jerry had some ideas about that, so we set up a mail room. But a few, a few months later, I began to uh, get into at least things that I had some smattering knowledge about. Uh, Jerry asked me to uh, do something about this research and sort of get involved in it and start thinking about it. As I said, I had had a little bit of training. I knew something about research. And what I knew about research and drug abuse was that it actually had, had advanced uh, in the last 20 years before that. Uh, there had been a lot of research going on in the, at the Addiction Research Center in Lexington, Kentucky, where Jerry had trained. 
And the people who had come out of the Addiction Research Center had a series of ideas that Jerry had brought with him uh, to the University of Chicago and, of course, uh, to Washington. Now, think about this for a second, that, that uh, in 1971, this was seven years after methadone was introduced. Vincent Dole introduced in 1964. It was very controversial. Uh, people were saying all kinds of things about it, as you heard about it. It's an experimental protocol. It shouldn't be approved. It's going to be diverted onto the streets and so forth. But the, there, there seemed to be no question that this stuff was, was useful. But what had happened in, in, in Lexington, and what Jerry had brought with him some of these ideas, and I, I quickly read some of his papers at that point, he was ex had been experimenting with some long-acting forms of methadone. One of them called, uh, the, the, the one that was available was l alpha acetyl methadol. It was a long-acting compound that might be able to be useful, but it wasn't available, really. And there were these ideas that what you could do was block the action of heroin. I remember talking to Bob DuPont about this. He called me, and we were talking about this idea of an antagonist. Could you block the stuff? Well, this is kind of an interesting idea, and, and that you could give something, and if someone takes heroin, it doesn't have any effect, and since it wouldn't have an effect, the, the urge to use the heroin would go away. That was the general idea, and it was introduced uh, essentially by people in, in, uh, in Lexington at the Addiction Research Center. The problem was all of the available treatments were very short-acting. They would last for 20 minutes or something. So you can, I mean, it's like the rats are in the, my bathroom. I mean, it doesn't work. I mean, you can't, you can't keep injecting this stuff. So then the, the idea that there could be a science of addiction was Im embedded in the Special Action Office right from the beginning. It was as important as, in some ways, as the idea of the legislation and the power of the government and the fact that we had power perhaps beyond OMB. So one of the first things that, that we were involved in and that I was involved in with Paul in particular was trying to figure out how to make methadone more available and that uh, I, Jerry had asked me to go to Hillside Hospital and to work with some people who could create a, uh, and, and come up with some sort of a way to monitor how many methadone programs were there in the country. As I recall, there were something like 490 of them or something. And we, we got information about how many people were getting treatment and all these FDA agents went around and, and questioned people, as some of us may remember. But we, but so, so we, we ended up trying to figure out how to, uh, how, to, how to do something about the methadone regulations. Two things that we stimulated, I think, are, are ended up of great importance. One of them was, and Jerry referred to that, this, this follow-up study of, that Lee Robbins uh, ran. The idea was, what would happen to people when they came back from Vietnam? Would they continue to use heroin? Uh, in the cities, we thought that the recidivism rate was going to be in the 90 percentile range or so. Would they continue to use or not? And so Jerry and I and others stimulated this, this, uh, uh, this research program, and David Nurko, who use, whose name you mentioned earlier, who's, who I guess passed away, David was involved in setting this up with Lee Robbins. And so there was this study. It's a landmark study. It turns out 11 percent recidivism rate after people came back from Vietnam, probably because of the way it was handled and partly because of the fact that this was a, a very unusual place. I mean, you were stepping on the vials everywhere, the 96 percent heroin. And, and what we now know is that there's a vulnerability that some people have and some people don't have probably. And so what was going on was this stuff was being used by a lot of people who might otherwise not be vulnerable to, to addiction, but were in an environment where it was, it was freely available. You know, and, 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 a, and a, a second result was the development of many of these drugs. We were trying to uh, figure out how to, uh, how, to, how to bring new drugs, uh, make them available. In fact, the legislation that Paul talked about had a section on it that said we were to create, develop, and test long-acting narcotic, long-acting methadone-like drugs and long-acting narcotic antagonists. So how do, how do you go about doing this? Well, it was, it was an interesting thing. We, had, we brought representatives from the pharmaceutical industry into Washington. And they, they were testifying, you remember? But they also came to our office and they said, well, there are a number of these compounds that they had on their shelves that actually might be of some value, especially some of these narcotic antagonists. Uh, the trouble was, the reason that they weren't being developed was because there was no market. So this was a, these were drugs that conceivably could be useful, but were never going to make any money for the pharmaceutical company. So Paul and I were talking about it, and we came up with this way of trying to 
to help the companies develop these drugs without losing the rights to the drugs, and yet the government could help pay for it. And so this innovative program was put together, and as we were talking earlier, there were a series of these, and they had all kinds of fancy names, EN1639A from Endo, BC2605 from Bristol, M5050 from Rickett, all these, these things. And I had, I remember I had on my, on my office a, a chart of all these different drugs, and we had to do, test them in animals, we had to test them in people, and it turns out one of them, EN1639A, became a drug that actually was marketed. It's called naltrexone, and it's available for the treatment, it was, and ended up being available for the treatment of heroin addiction. We were also trying to figure out at that time whether you could come up with a biodegradable polymer, something that you could inject into, let's say, the muscle of somebody, and it would gradually release this stuff. It just, we, we never figured it out. We never got it because we couldn't, uh, the, uh, the people who were working on it and we funded to work on it couldn't come up with something that would release in a graduated way. There is one now, but it, it, and it's 30 years later, but we couldn't, we couldn't do it. So it's not to say that everybody agreed with what we did uh, in the scientific community. Jerry asked me to talk about policy and science and science and policy, and the fact is that we, got hit by a lot of criticism from the scientific community. I remember shortly after I went to join Jerry, he invited me to go with him to a meeting in San Juan uh, of the, something called the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, which is the, it, it's, it's sort of the elite organization. I didn't even know what it was then, but I do now because I'm a member. So I can say it's an elite organization, right? <laughs> it, it, it's a, it is an elite organization of people who do this kind of research. So anyway, we go to this meeting, and there's this fellow in a bit, there's a big special, uh, uh, kind of a special convocation or something, and there's this guy there going on and on about the drug policy and about this guy Jaffe. I think Paul was there, I don't know if I remember correctly. And, and he's talking about Nazism. This is what, what they're doing, this is draconian. I mean, you're gonna poison people. This is you know, like being a Nazi or something. I said, my God, what the earth have I gotten myself involved in here? This is really nuts. And uh, so there were strong opinions opposed to the use of methadone, strong opinions uh, opposed to the idea that you could use a drug to treat a drug, to treat a drug problem. And I actually thought the science was totally on our side. And I, didn't, I couldn't quite figure this. I couldn't fathom it. I didn't know where this emotion was coming from, but it didn't seem to be reasonable to me. And it doesn't to this, this day actually seem reasonable to me. It's, it's, but nonetheless, we were, we were in for some criticism. Another area of criticism that we were hit with was that the scientific community was unable to get drugs for research. They couldn't get LSD, for instance, they couldn't get heroin, they couldn't get drugs like that, so-called Schedule I drugs from that, from that legislation. And the reason they couldn't get it was because the BNDD, as I got it, had come up with, with, with regulations that forced them to get these huge safes and root the damn things in concrete or something so they could keep them in their laboratories to do the research. And, and the scientific community went berserk. They, could, they said, this is nuts, we can't do this research. So again, Paul and I had the uh, wonderful uh, time of trying to figure out how to change these regs, which we did do with, the, with BNDD and thinking about it with BNDD and the FDA. And so the community was perhaps pretty much on our side. So thinking back on it, what, is, what, did, the, what did SAIADAP do in science? Well, this EN1639A discovery and the development, it wasn't really a discovery, the development of naltrexone, which, w which has been used in the treatment of heroin addiction, which is now available in a long-acting form because the polymers are now available. In the last two or three years, they've become available. They're called microspheres, and they actually work. There's a company in Cambridge uh, called Alchemiers that makes these things, and you can, you can make it, and, and, and naltrexone is now available. What, what actually happened was really interesting. Now, Trexone, in, in, in 1980-something, uh, it was discovered that now Trexone actually blocks the action of alcohol as well. So you have a drug that was developed for the treatment of heroin addiction, turns out is the, perhaps one of the primary treatments for alcoholism. And the series of developments, and one other thing that the Special Action Office did was to fund, through NIDA and through when Bob uh, DuPont was there, a number of drug research centers. And these drug research centers started realizing and finding that, for instance, there are receptors in the brain at which heroin acts. Saul Snyder discovered that. There are chemicals in the brain that are like heroin. 
there are receptors in the brain that are that where marijuana acts, and there are chemicals in the brain that are like marijuana. These plants actually are inside of us. You know, I guess we came from the plants. Sometimes I feel like a plant. So, you know, a growing plant. That is Jerry, not a. Uh, Jerry's so 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 fast that he uh, he gets all the puns. So, uh, I think this office. Uh, really stimulated science in, in, a, in, in, in policy in a way that I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's been done before, but it, it was really quite, I think it's really quite amazing to me. It, it stems from his, his sort of thinking. The idea that you can have a biologic basis for a, a drug abuse problem stems from some of what we were doing and some of what Jerry was thinking about. I mean, it's not all Jerry's thinking, of course, other people have contributed, but this is where this field is right now, that the bio biologic treatments for uh, uh, alcoholism, for cocaine, for uh, cocaine problems, for marijuana problems, uh, for alcohol problems are front and center of medicine right now. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are no longer saying that this is, these are compounds that are going to be orphan drugs because there's no profit in them. In fact, they're running as fast as they can to develop new drugs because it's, a, it's such a common problem. The fact that we were able to start some of these things in many ways, I think, reflects the fact that there was a scientist in the White House. There was a, a man who really, uh, I mean, again, I was a, I was a kid. I, I didn't know anything about this other than my rats in the bathroom. And I, I realized when I signed on that uh, I was working with someone who probably knew more about this than anyone else. And that here in the, in the White House, there was someone running policy who, across the world knew more about it and had synthesized the information as much as anybody else. So uh, the fact that SAYADAP uh, was a bright era, and perhaps the brightest era, in drug abuse research, starting the, 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 the ball rolling on getting research into the national agenda as a treatment arm and helping the treatment for heroin addiction, for alcohol addiction, for cocaine addiction, for problems with marijuana, problems with methamphetamine, problems with other drugs, problems with smoking, problems with gambling, problems with obesity, because they're all, on some levels, problems of what is something that's now known as the brain reward circuit. And that it all evolved out of this, and a lot of it is due to this guy. And it was uh, my great pleasure to be his special assistant, not all the time, <laughs> not all the time, but mostly. Again, we, we remember things a little differently. I, 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 no, I, I think it, it, it's candid to say that uh, if Einstein hadn't come up with the theory of relativity when he did, somebody would have done it 10 years later. I mean, the fact is we did prime the pump for drug addiction research more than would have happened. But I just can't believe that somebody wouldn't have gotten the idea that you've got to know something if you're going to intervene and develop sensible policy. So I don't think we should claim credit for the, the whole thing, uh, it would have happened anyway. And it's certainly, I think, frankly, the pendulum has swung a little too far in the biological direction, uh, that it's a brain disease. It's a complicated uh, interaction. And uh, you know, uh, it'll swing back, I'm confident, <laughs> in, in time. But uh, you know, let's, I'd like to hear from my friend Benny Prim, who uh, was with me in Vietnam probably took care of me when I got sick in Vietnam, and has certainly been on the front lines of uh, addiction policy and treatment and HIV for uh, at least 40 years. Uh, and uh, have him say a few words to us for a few minutes. Benny, welcome. How's she doing? I'm just, uh, just so content and exhilarated, really, to be here to, to rejoin some old friends and colleagues that uh, I have the fondest of memories of. Um, I cannot tell you how much I reflect upon my association with Jerry, uh, which goes back to a hotel here in Washington, D.C., and I'm in the back of the room at that hotel at a meeting, um, and all of a sudden, I get a message that somebody wants to see me, 
and that person that wants to see me is Jerry Jaffe, and he comes to the back of the room, and he invites me to go to Vietnam with him. Uh, I'm a retired Army officer. I said, I'm a retired paratrooper officer, and I don't want any part of any war, anything else. And, and Jerry said, well, it's, uh, uh, I'd like you to go with me because you have shown some knowledge in addiction. You came out to visit me in Chicago when I had started up a program in New York. Uh, and Stu Nightingale knows about that, and he had uh, worked with me in Brooklyn. He would, ran a program there where I had started up a methadone maintenance treatment program. And so uh, I went out to visit Jerry, uh, maybe, maybe uh, six uh, months or a year before that time, and looked at what he had as a comprehensive substance abuse treatment program in Chicago. Uh, he had a therapeutic community. He had uh, uh, certainly a methadone maintenance treatment program. He had L-alpha acetomethanol uh, uh, that Green, Dr. Green spoke about all of this functioning under one umbrella and doing extremely well. He was working with the courts. Uh, Paul Perito mentioned very briefly uh, some of the things that Jerry was doing but didn't, wasn't specific about it, treatment alternatives to street crime, which became really developed more so at uh, the, uh, the Special Action Office. And so anyway, when Jerry asked me to go to Vietnam, I, I said, I don't want to do that. He says, well, come on, join me. We'll be fine. We're going to leave in two days or three days. And I couldn't believe this. And I said, well, you know, I have to tell my wife. She said, we'll take care of that. And uh, we'll, fly, <laughs> we'll fly you over there and so forth. So we went. And when we got there, we began to visit uh, treatment centers. Uh, Jeff Donfell was on the plane with us. Bud Croak was already uh, uh, over there somewhere. And, uh, somewhere. And, and in Laos, I think. You had gone to Laos or somewhere like that. And uh, we, we stopped initially in Alaska. And then we went from Alaska to, uh, to Taiwan, and then to Hong Kong, and then on to Vietnam. Uh, it was an incredible, incredible experience. We tested at what we call the pea house of the August moon, Jerry named it. Uh, we did urinalysis testing uh, for all the troops up to the rank of major. Uh, we, uh, uh, all of those persons who were found to be positive for substances, uh, we identified them uh, and they were to be shipped back to the United States, of course and into drug treatment programs back here in the United States. Uh, we had some incredible experiences in Vietnam. I think one that I remember so very well was with General Bernstein and Jerry and I were flying up to the front lines to talk to persons up there who had been identified to possibly be using drugs. They were not yet had been tested with uh, uh, the SIVA machine, which we took with us, by the way. If you recall, we took the first urinalysis testing machine on the plane with us to Vietnam. Uh, and uh, it was the first time testing had been done through your analysis like that. So we, uh, uh, we, we, we heard about this far-flunged area uh, north where there were major problems and of people using heroin and other drugs. And we uh, got on the plane to go up there. On the way up there, there was a terrific storm, and it was a two-engine uh, propeller plane, if I recall correctly. And one of the engines went out on the plane. And Jerry and General Bernstein became terrifically ill on the plane. And I'm sitting there and with no parachute, and I'm saying to myself, you know, here I am back in Vietnam, a paratrooper with no parachute, and this plane is going to crash, and it's probably going to be over in enemy territory, and I'm going to get killed up here. And, <laughs> and Jerry and General Bernstein got sick and were really vomiting and going on very, very bad, very bad in the back. So uh, he ended up being sick, and General Bernstein ended up being sick, and then Jerry put me in charge of doing everything possible on this particular mission. And then from that point on, he got very sick and had to go to the hospital and I became in charge of whatever he wanted me to do there in Vietnam. Coming back from Nam, though, we uh, stopped in Hawaii, at least I was allowed to stop in Hawaii, and invite some of my friends who had been 
in service with me who were serving in Vietnam who were able to come back and, and celebrate uh, uh, with me on R&R. &R. They were ordered back. They didn't know why they were being ordered back by this guy, Benny Prim, who supposedly had the rank of a major general. I don't know, Dr. Bob God, how I got that, but that was supposedly what I could do to Definitely order these guys yeah. back. <laughs> the, the, the president knighted me for that particular <laughs> period of time. But anyway, uh, we, we celebrated there. Uh, Jerry came on back to the United States, and I was to meet them at San Clemente. And I came back to San Clemente and met with Bud Krogh, uh, the president, and Jerry, and John Erdickman. And we had quite a meeting and got uh, orders of what we would do when we got back here. Uh, we went back to Quad Washington, of course. Jerry said, Benny, I want you to continue to be of help to me. And you've got to develop some things for these people returning back to the United States. Because what are we going to do with them? We don't have drug treatment programs for them to go to. Uh, the VA hospitals, the Army base and the Army hospitals uh, don't know how to treat addicts. So you need to form a team under the direction of Jeff Donfell uh, and a group of people that will go to the, the Veterans Administration, go to these Army posts, and teach them how to treat addicts as they come back to the United States. Well, I formed a team, and I remember some of those guys, Joy Joya and Matt Wright from uh, Jerry's program, Carl Langan from my program in New York, and Danny Cook from my program in New York, Sandy Jackson, who came out of Phoenix House uh, with uh, Mitch Rosenthal's program. So we sent these people out to all these different uh, 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 posts, Army posts, and, and of course VA hospitals to teach them how to uh, uh, be able to uh, treat the addicted individuals who were returning from Vietnam. And it was quite, a, quite an ordeal. As you, as you remember, Jeff, we had numbers of training sessions. Did you show any of those slides, Jerry? Uh, you did? You go turn them on. So you'll see us in sessions training those people and getting them ready to go. They went out to all these places and so uh, really were very successful in uh, making sure in making sure that these people knew what they were doing. I also had the responsibility while working in the office as a consultant back and forth in New York to make my own program right uh, in New York, which was just starting up at that time and getting underway. We were to treat about 5,000 addicts in both Brooklyn and Harlem, and uh, I was busy doing that along with doing whatever task that uh, I was assigned to with Jerry. Uh, and it was quite an interesting time dealing with the National Institute uh, on Mental Health, where Lois Chatham and Bert Brown and Cost Cart Besterman and that whole group uh, were somewhat in competition, I felt, with the Special Action Office of Drug Abuse Prevention and, and sort of had a resentment more than a cooperative attitude in helping us do what we'd have to do. And Jerry at some time had to exercise uh, the mandate given to him by the president that he would knock heads if you didn't cooperate with Jerry. And of course, uh, he got him to do pretty much what he wanted him to do uh, out there. Uh, and I was part of that, and I was a part of trying to expand methadone maintenance treatment programs throughout the country uh, and helping people get started. Uh, and it was an, in, an incredible experience to build up to what we have today. Uh, subsequent to that time, of course, uh, and being associated with Jerry has given me such uh, notoriety and acclaim uh, that I've been tapped to do other things in the federal government, and I became the first director of the Office of Treatment Improvement at Adamha, which later on became the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And so uh, I have also uh, been tapped to be a consultant to a number of the presidents since President Nixon and to offer up a very positive and comprehensive plan for substance abuse treatment in our major cities and, and, and other parts of the world. And it's primarily due to my association and learning from uh, Jerry Jaffe, much like Dr. Green talked about. Uh, in this room are so many people. I see Peter Bourne and, 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 and Nightingale and so many others and, and Eric Wish and, and, and th that I've worked with. And it's just such a great honor to be here. But all in all, it's been a wonderful experience for me. I don't think I've been as
clear as I could have been had I had Jerry told me that I was going to get up here and speak about uh, what we did. We do that. Uh, but that's great. Uh, uh, ex extemporaneously, I hope I have served him well, as yes, he has served me well so many of these years. I love him dearly, and all the rest of you have been so helpful to me. Thank you. Well, we, we've uh, pretty much used up our time, but maybe we can take one or two questions for this panel, because uh, we'll have more questions after this to Dick. We need to take this. One of the urban legends around the start of the Pratt machines was that Jerry guaranteed them on his American Express coat. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's, that's close. Uh, what happened after Jeff consulted with me about the Vietnam situation, and we talked about doing testing, uh, the technology was, I had on order for the state of Illinois the only machine of its kind in the world but we knew that we needed two of them, one in Long Bin and one in, uh, Cameron Bay. in Cameron Bay. So I called the head of the company, and I told him, look, I really cannot give you any further information because at the time, everything in the Nixon administration was secret. Usually. C can't say anything. <laughs> I said, but I am calling from Washington, and I would like to know uh, you know, whether you have another machine, and he said, no. Uh, I said, well, uh, how long would it take to make one? He said, uh, three weeks. I said, well, what if you put people on uh, double shift or even triple shift? He said, a week and a half. I said, well, you know, I think I can speak for the state of Illinois about this, but not exactly. Uh, but I will guarantee that we'll pay for this thing and put the people on. And that's how we had two such machines, one for each place. And it actually didn't come with us, as Benny remembers it. People's memories change a little over 35 years. It actually went on the plane before we got there, so it could be set up. And they tried to offload it at Guam. But we had the vice president of Saiva handcuffed to one of the machines, <laughs> and he refused to allow it to get off at Guam. <laughs> and that's how it arrived, the, the machines arrived safely. But we actually <laughs> sent him to Vietnam because at that time there was only one person who knew how to set the machines up. And it was the guy who put them together. So we, we actually sent the, the other interesting thing was he said, well, I don't have a passport. And somebody, and I don't know who it was at the office because at that time there were probably only four of us, called up and he got a call from the State Department to immediately go over to the local office, and they got him a passport in something like four hours. It was really one of these amazing things. I've never been so astounded at what the White House can do. The call from the president can get done <laughs> in the bureaucracy. Well, I joined uh, SAODEP. I was the second or third or fourth employee as a detailee from Don Rumsfeld in OEO. I see. And wow. at OEO, I sat on the Burt Brown Task Force. We had a huge interagency meeting out at NIMH. We taught, we, everybody gave their inputs. We were given assignments. And then we waited. And we heard nothing in a month. And we heard nothing in two months. And about 10 weeks later, we were called back. And Burt Brown presented our report that he said we agreed upon, which was about that thick, compared to Jerry's, which was about that thick, and quite rightly, uh, the NIMH report, of course, said make us in charge and give us more money. And uh, I don't think they ever forgave you for uh, them not uh, getting that job. Well, I don't know. Karst Besteman is here. Uh, we counted on Karst. He was somebody, if Karst gives you his word, you can take his word. You can take it to the bank. Uh, Karst, above all things, is an honest man. And I knew him from Lexington. And I think without him, we couldn't have done all the things we did, given the resistance of NIMH to a lot of the things we were trying to yeah. do. But he can tell you whether we were ever forgiven or not. <laughs> well, uh, could I tell one? one Jerry, that's in our panel. Okay. Could I tell one final, final quick story? I think Alan Green might have been with us. 
I was walking back with Jerry from the White House early on, and Alan Green was with us, and Jerry was musing, maybe I've got this wrong, about his parents uh, living in this nice apartment uh, uh, above their store in Chicago and saying they had worked all their life to get a home so they didn't have to live above the store. And he turned back and he said, and there's the president, and he lives above the store. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, for the record, a couple of things. What were the ingredients of the successful revolution? Well, first of all, you had two just superb staff people on the White House staff who were tasked with solving a problem. As, as Bud said, the problem was crime and drugs. The solution ran through treatment. But one of the things, and, it, and it's been alluded to, but it needs to be, it, it needs to be made very, very clear. We could have been at NIMH and been this smart, and nothing would have happened. It was Dick Nixon, the staff's ability to convince Dick Nixon to, to put budgetary money and presidential prestige and publicity behind this program. Uh, and that was due to, to superb staff work by two people, but it, but it was also a president who was open to an idea that wasn't his. The second thing that we're celebrating, we're celebrating two authentic heroes, Jerry Jaffe and Bob DuPont. And, and, and there should be no doubt about that. But they aren't heroes because of Sayodap. They're heroes because of what they did before they came to work for the government. And it really is unique to take really, really top people who aren't political and put them in charge. And that, that I think, is absolutely key to what led to this. And the third thing is the ideas. And, and I just, my, my take is different because memories are, are different from 30 years ago, but the, the brilliance of the Vietnam strategy uh, with the urinalysis was just superb because you, you, you remember it was experimental to, to say the least. And it really was a three day test. If you were clean for three days, the urinalysis came out clean. And there was a lot of criticism that that had nothing to do with addiction, that we were bringing these guys back and dumping them on society, and it was becoming a political problem. And it was Jerry's point, at least made to me, that's why I remember it. It was Jerry's point that it was the culture over there that would, the availability and the difficulty of serving, and that if you had to be clean to come home, and being clean said three days, that you were going to be OK. And what is your analysis did, the famous pea house of the August moon, what it did was separate the amateurs from the professional addicts. Because if indeed, with, with your own will and desire to get home, which was pretty damn persuasive, if you could do that, you could come, you could come home clean. And it was a huge difference, benefit for the military, but, but it was Jerry. And the second thing is methadone. Methadone is, a, is an experiment. Methadone is not, not accepted by science. And we had two people with the data who really believed in it. And, and we alluded to this beforehand, that with methadone and methadone's availability put, put out across, across the country, those of us who dwelt in the dark side who were in, in, in favor of a law enforcement response could push as hard as we wanted because of Jerry's promise and Bob's promise that no addict would be denied treatment, that there wouldn't be a situation where someone was addicted to heroin and they couldn't come and get methadone. And that marriage of those two things, of law enforcement and treatment, is, is what enabled this to be successful. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to come say this, because these, these people said it. Paul talked about an a, a, a absolutely unanimous vote. Bud and, Bud and uh, Jeff, you notice there's two Jeffs who work for Bud. There was Jeff Treatment and Jeff Law Enforcement. So Bud was able to say, oh, that's Jeff's problem. You know, and it really didn't matter which, which way it went. They were, Covered the waterfront. <laughs> they, were inter they, were, they were interchangeable. But, and then, and then the, two, the two authentic heroes from today. Thank you. Bob, I just wanted to say that, you know, we are here today to celebrate Jerry and Bob. And it, it goes back and forth between the two of them. Because in 1969, late 69, that's why I asked for the date, Bob was my teacher. 
I mean, we went to facilities, you were in my office regularly, and Bob tells Jeff, Jeff treatment, go see Jerry. Yeah. I mean, this was something that was a process that was going on between these gentlemen that led to where we were today and what we were eventually able to accomplish. And I just, as, as one who was somewhat of an outsider watching it, I want to thank you both for what you've brought to this program and what you're doing today. I think Jeff is right. It's who they were before they came and attracted other people, Paul, Alan, Bob, Jeff, me. I mean, we're all in your debt. I just want to thank you both. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ten-minute break, and we'll be back.